Go to Jeremiah chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 5 through 10 this morning. No, God, through Jeremiah, challenged the nation of Judah to repent, to turn their hearts to him and turn away from their sinful ways. And in doing so, he also gave them several warnings. Throughout the whole book of Jeremiah, there was warning after warning of disaster that was coming. So the title of today's message is God's warnings must be heeded. God's warnings must be heeded. If you would stand with me as we read our scripture today. Starting in verse 5. Announce in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Sound the trumpet throughout the land. Cry aloud and say, Gather together, let us flee to the fortified cities. Raise the signal to go to Zion. Flee for safety without delay, for I am bringing disaster from the north, even terrible destruction. A lion has come out of his lair. A destroyer of nations has set out. He has left his place to lay waste your land. Your towns will lie in ruins without inhabitants. So put on sackcloth, lament and wail, for the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned away from us. In that day, declares the Lord, the king and the officials will lose heart, the priests will be horrified, and the prophets will be appalled. Then I said, Alas, sovereign Lord, how completely you have deceived this people and Jerusalem by saying, You will have peace when the sword is at our throats. Father, as we come to this difficult passage, Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand it, but also help us to apply it to our lives, Lord. I pray that you'd be with me as I deliver your word, deliver the message, Father. And I pray you would use me as your tool and your vocal cords this morning. God, lay me aside uh, my intentions and desires, Father. Help me to just present the truth without delay. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When God gives a warning, what should we do? Ignore it, right? How does that work? Yeah, when your parents give you a warning, what should you do? Pay attention, right? Don't ignore it. Don't pretend like you didn't hear it. Especially if that warning comes with a, a promise. Like it's really a threat, but it's a promise that if you don't do this, I will do this, or you will be punished in some kind of way. Yeah, we need to listen to the warnings of those ahead of us, right? Well, in the same way, when God gives us a warning, we need to tune in. Because if God says it, it's important. It is very important. In the context of our scripture today, God told Jeremiah to announce to Judah a disaster that was coming from the north. It's not specifically spelled out in this passage, but he was referring to the nation of Babylon. North was Babylon, Babylonia, the city of the city Babylonia and Babylon, the nation, were rising up, and there was this strong world power that was going to come to Jerusalem and destroy it. And it would bring terrible destruction. But this leads me to a first question I want to ask and then hopefully answer. Why would God give a warning? Why would God give a warning? I think, number one, God's warning is a sign of His mercy. God is not obligate us, obligated to warn us of His judgment. He can simply just do it without telling us about it. He doesn't have to answer to us. But by Him giving us a warning, it is a sign to inform us, to warn us, to challenge us. To repent. In a subtle way, it is an opportunity to repent from our sins so that God would relent from sending the disaster. You may remember the story of Jonah and the Ninevites. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it. He had a very simple message, and his message was, In 40 days, this city will be overthrown. Well, there was no real call to repentance in that message. It was a very simple message. And that was the only thing in Scripture that it says. Well, that mess, Jonah finally, after a long detour, he finally made it to Nineveh. And he started to preach this message. And he started telling everybody, in 40 days, this city will be overthrown. 
And finally, the news, the warning, got to the king, the king of Nineveh. And listen to what the king says after hearing this message. He says to the people, Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them drink or eat, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. And covered with sackcloth is a sign of mourning, a sign of sadness. Okay? Covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. The king, who was a pagan king, was telling everyone in his, in his city to let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, he says. Listen to what he says here. Who knows? God may yet relent. And with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And so even the king understood that God may not. He may, he may not relent. He may continue to send disaster, but in his thoughts, in his mind, he, he at least came to this conclusion, whether God has compassion on us or not, or relents from his ways or not, it is better to die with a repentant heart than a wayward one. Amen? A pagan king came to that conclusion, but yet the people of Judah were so far from God, there was simply nothing that Jeremiah could say that would pierce through their hearts because their hearts were like stone. God even warns Judah to call to repentance here. You know, unlike the nation of, or the Ninevites, God didn't even give them the opportunity, or the, the, the call to repent. It was kind of subtly in there, but he didn't give them a direct call to repentance. But he gave Judah a direct call to repent. He says in verse 14 of chapter 4, Jerusalem, wash the evil from your hearts and be saved. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? Over and over again, God called Judah to repent. So if you repent, I will, re I will relent, was often the message. Did they repent? Oh, well, after the punishment was ensued, I guess you could say they did. But before the punishment, no, they did not. Not only was God, uh, God's warning a sign of mercy, but number two here, God's warning gives a heavenly perspective of earthly events. What do you mean by that? Well, think about it. How would you have understood the situation differently if God had not warned of the coming disaster upon them? If God had not told Judah, and therefore told us as well, if God had not told us about Babylon coming and destroying, if he never mentioned it, but yet at the same time Babylon still came and destroyed, how would you interpret it differently? Would you see that that was an act of God, that God was using them? I don't know that you would have come to that conclusion by yourself. But because we have God's foreknowledge and because we have God's word and his prophecy and his warning, we can see that the event that happened to Judah was God using them. Now, did Babylon know they were being used by God? Did King Nebuchadnezzar know that he was being used by God? Maybe to some degree, but probably not. I mean, he was not a God-fearer, at least not yet. He eventually came to be one. But when he came and destroyed Jerusalem, he was not a God-fearer. He heard of the prophecies. He heard of Jeremiah. And he gave Jeremiah an opportunity to come to the nation of Babylon and be protected because he was speaking favorably upon Babylon. But he was not a God-fearer. He was a polytheist. They worshiped many gods. And he actually pretty much even saw himself as one worthy of worship. He built a statue and told everybody to worship and bow down to it. You probably remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The reason why they were thrown in the fire because they didn't worship the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. My point is this, God can use people without their knowledge of him using them. In the same way, God can use us without ever informing us of how he's using us. He doesn't have to tell us. But he can use each and every one of us in each and every situation to bring about good. In a similar way, God used Pilate. Y'all remember Pilate, right? 
Okay? Pilate in the New Testament with Jesus being executed, he used Pilate to bring about the greatest good the world's ever seen. The execution of Christ and the salvation of men. So a further question upon that. Does God compromise a person's free will when he uses them? This is a complicated subject. Now, I'm not going to be able to tackle it in this short amount of time, but I'll give you at least a brief perspective on this. I don't think so. I don't think he compromises a person's free will by using them. God didn't force them to make the choices that they make. He didn't force Babylon to go into Jerusalem and, and take it over. He didn't force Pilate to execute Jesus. He just knew Pilate would execute Jesus. He just knew Babylon would take over. He knows, actually, he knows every decision you will ever make. He also knows every decision you would make if you had different situations. And so you could say that he could orchestrate the events around your life, knowing the decisions you would make, to bring about the most good. You see that? No, you can, take, you can dwell on that for the next 20 years and still not get it. I don't fully get it. But God knows, and he knows how to bring the most good. Even with our decisions, he knows how to bring out the most good. I don't know how he manages to figure it out, but he knows everything. He knows all of my thoughts, and he knows all of yours, however scary that may be. But he knows all of our desires, he knows all of our thoughts, and he knows every decision we have, we will make and would make. And he knows how to navigate the circumstances of life to bring about the greatest of, the greatest of good for the least amount of evil. You see that? Nothing happens outside of God's knowledge and sovereignty. Every earthly event has a heavenly perspective. You might remember the story of Job. The story of Job. Job didn't know the heavenly perspective of the events that he was going through. He was going through disaster after disaster. And it was hard on Job. And it wasn't until the end of his life that God opened his eyes and said, All right, there's some, there's some things behind the scene that you were not aware of. In the same way in the book of Revelation that we've been going through on Wednesday nights. We see a heavenly perspective of the earthly events that are coming. God has a purpose in heaven. For every earthly event, there is a heavenly event as well. And God's warning gives us a heavenly perspective of what happens on earth. God is in control of all things. God is in control of all things. Every disaster and storm of life that we fall into whether it be ones that we've caused on our own decisions, ones that we've fallen into because of someone else's decisions, or just to, the, the fact that God, we live in a sinful world, all reasons for causes of disaster that we find ourselves in, i got some good news for you. God knows how to use it for good. However it came about, why ever it came about, God can use it for good. And how do we get the goodness out of it? By drawing closer to Him. The more and more we draw closer to Him, the better we will receive the lessons we can learn from them. Number two, second question. Why would God bring destruction to His people? Why would God bring destruction to His people? Uh, if you flip over to the next chapter, chapter 5, verse 1, He says... God is talking to Jeremiah and says, Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look around and consider. Search through her squares. If you, have, if you can find but one person, one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. Now, if, if you may remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Right before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, Abraham was actually sitting on a mountainside, and he was talking to these visitors that came to visit him. They were heavenly visitors. He was talking to God. And he was looking over the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God was sharing with him how he was about to destroy the city. And Abraham's like, wait, God, you're going to destroy the righteous along with the wicked? Forgive me, Lord, but what if there's a hundred people in this city? Would you still destroy it? And God says, okay. 
If there's a hundred people in this city, I will not destroy it. And then Abraham says, well, why, why just a hundred? What if there's 50 people in it that are righteous? Would you still destroy the city? He says, okay, I won't destroy the city if there's 50 people in it. He says, what if there's 10 less? What if there's 40? <laughs> and he ends up getting down to about 10 people. He says, okay, Lord, if there's 10 people in this city, would you still destroy it? The Lord says, no, I will not destroy the city if there's just 10 righteous people in it. Oh, if you know the story, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, but it wasn't before the only family that was righteous was brought out, which was Abraham's nephew, Lot. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. You may question the righteousness of the two daughters and Lot, but that's a different story. You can go read about it in Genesis if you're curious. It's, it gets kind of, oof. But at any rate, God brought them out of the city and saved them. However, the city was destroyed. So you could say there was only four righteous people in the city. Questionably Lot's wife, because she turned and looked back, turned into a pillar of salt. But at any rate, what can we learn from this? And how it applies to Judah. God was saying, go to Jerusalem, see if there's any one righteous person. If you find one righteous person, I won't destroy the city. That seems like a very low expectation, right? I mean, you could at least find one righteous person, right, to save this city. What do we learn from this? Number one, I think God judges with purpose, not in ignorance. God is not random in his justice. He is not random in his judgment. If God judges a nation, it is due punishment. They deserve to be punished. So God judges with purpose, but number two, he protects spiritually those who are committed to him. Just like he protected Lot. He brought Lot out of the city. He actually protected a remnant in Judah by exiling them to, the, to, um, to Babylon for 70 years. Where they learned some lessons there, eventually he came back. They came back and reestablished the nation of, of Israel and Jerusalem. But God promises believers that we will be saved from the hour of great tribulation. If you read Revelations chapter 10 and the, tri the tribulation that's to come in the end times, Revelation 3.10, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you, talking about believers in Christ, Keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now whether that protection is divine protection through the tribulation or a rapture when God brings his church out of the earth, uh, we could see both of those are promises fulfilled in the end times. Regardless, God does not promise for you to live forever on earth. <laughs> Not in your current state. Now you will live forever on the new earth when it's created, but we are not made to live forever here on earth. We are just passing through. So God's promise here is not just to protect your body, because our bodies will decay and will die, right? God's promise is a spiritual protection, most importantly, saying that you will be saved permanently because you are in the Father's care. You're in the care of the great shepherd who watches over you. He saves you spiritually from the attacks of the enemy. The enemy can't snatch you out of his hand. I thank the Lord for that. Amen. He protects us spiritually. Now, he may protect us materially or may protect us uh, physically as well in certain times of our lives. But we can't, we can't lean on that promise indefinitely because... You think of all the disciples that went before him, or went before us, who were brutally murdered and martyred for their faith, because they took a stand for the gospel. So God's promise is that he will spiritually protect those who are committed to him. Third reason is that he judges only after plenteous time for repentance. When God judged a nation back in the Old Testament, several occasions, 
he told the people of Israel to go and wipe out this nation. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Just wipe them out for the sake of wiping them out? No. You wipe them out because their sins have gone up before God. They have refused to repent, and God says enough is enough. They were given ample time to repent. You might remember the story of the Amalekites. The king Saul told Israel to go and wipe them out. They were given hundreds of years to repent, yet they refused. Israel and Judah were given thousands of years to repent before God finally banished them, and they refused to repent. God gives humanity thousands of years to repent, but eventually enough is enough. Matter of fact, you could argue this way, if if God knew that it would take a million years for you to repent from your sins and turn to the Lord, do you think God would be merciful enough and loving enough to let you live for a million years so that you would repent? I believe He would. But since I know that people die a lot earlier than a million years, it is my presumption, my estimation of things, that it wouldn't matter if you give them and an infinite number of years, if people die without Christ, they would never receive Christ, regardless of how long and how many chances they're given. That may seem rude. It may seem kind of blunt. But I believe that's a spiritual truth. Number three, I want you to notice Jeremiah's response to God's warning. He appeared to accuse God of deceit. You see that? Verse 10. He appeared to accuse God of deceit. Alas, sovereign Lord, how completely you have deceived this people and Jerusalem by saying you will have peace when the sword is at their throats. You see, Jeremiah was hearing these other prophets that were going around the city and they were proclaiming, we're going to have peace, it's going to be prosperous, we're going to be good, and it's, everything's going to be all right. That's what the, the other prophets were saying. And then Jeremiah hears what the Lord actually says. He says, no, you're not going to have peace, you're going to have disaster. And it's going to be awful. And Jeremiah's like, well, why did you tell them that? <laughs> and finally Jeremiah figured it out and said, oh, they... You didn't tell them that. They were prophesying lies. They were not prophesying the truth. They were prophesying what people wanted to hear, not what they needed to hear. That sound familiar for today? Right? They were prophesying what sounded good, what itched the ear, what satisfied them, what made them popular because they want to elevate themselves and be in good standing. But that wasn't the truth. I heard a a preacher say recently, he says, don't confuse sincerity with accuracy. You hear that? Don't confuse sincerity with accuracy. You can be really sincere in how you present the message and really truly believe it yourself, but just because it appears to be sincere doesn't mean it's accurate. If it's going to be accurate, it's going to be consistent with the Word of God. Amen? God does not speak in contradictions. The devil does. But God does not. So he appeared to accuse God of deceit, but he was really just speaking emotionally. And he was comparing to these other prophets, and he was coming to that conclusion that, oh wait, these prophets were telling lies. But he was also appalled. Think about Jeremiah in this situation. He is hearing what is coming for Jerusalem. And his heart was broken. You think about that. His whole life was about to change. His whole family was about to change. He didn't have a family of his own. He didn't have his own wife and kids. But he had brothers. He had sisters. He had family members. Everything was about to change for Jeremiah. How do you think you would feel if you were in Jeremiah's shoes? What if a prophecy came out about America and disaster coming? And if we didn't repent, this disaster would overtake us. Our whole life would change. 
All because we didn't obey the Lord. The best place to be is right smack in the middle of God's will. Amen? And although it may be hard to stay there at times, and walking with Him is not easy, it is surely worth it. But the good thing is, we don't walk alone. We are guided by the great shepherd, and he promises he will never leave us, he'll never forsake us. So our challenge today is heed God's warnings. But where can we find God's warnings? You may find them in wise counsel from others. You may find them in dreams. You may find them through history. But the primary means by which God gives us his warnings is through his word. So you may have a warning about a situation from a friend or a family or, or whatever. You may have a dream. Well, those should not be taken separately from God's word. Those things should be filtered through God's word. Amen? Now, God's word is the primary means by which God talks to us. And everything needs to be filtered through the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. And if we're not in the Word of God, we may misconstrue what God says, and we may start to believe that we will have peace when really we will have disaster. See the problem there? God's Word is the truth. God won't stop us from making wrong decisions. But be warned. Following the path of this world and fulfilling the desires of our hearts and the desires of our flesh can lead to eternal separation from God. But also be encouraged because God is a God of forgiveness. And He forgives those who come to Him in repentance. And I'm talking about those who come for salvation. For those that are saved, your sins are already forgiven but we still come and confess because we really need to repent from our sins continuously because I'm still a sinner. Anybody else? Yeah. But God loves us and he forgives us and I'm so glad I serve a God who loves. I'm so glad I serve a God who upholds justice and fairness. Amen. But we, treat, we continue to come to Him, and we love Him with all of our hearts, souls, and minds. And my challenge to you this morning is, are you heeding God's warning in your life? The ultimate warning is that we will spend eternity in hell without, if we die without receiving the cross of Christ. But God has provided a way out, a way of escape. Have you received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? If you have, praise the Lord. But we all know those in our, in our lives and our families that have not received. Pray for them. Pray for an opportunity to share Christ with them. But maybe God's warned you about something unrelated to that. I don't know. He may speak to you something personal. Heed the warning from God's word. And be obedient to him. And although disaster may come, just like it came for Judah... It came for Jeremiah. God can see you through it. Just depend and trust in him. Let's pray. Let's stand as we pray. Father, thank you for, so much for your word. I pray that you'd help us to receive the message you've prepared. Help us to understand how it applies to our lives specifically. You continue to fill us with your presence and your peace. And help us to walk in this, road, in this world, even though the road is narrow and even though it's a rough terrain at times, God, we, we trust that you are holding our hands, you are with us, you're guiding our steps, Lord, and we love you and thank you for it. Pray for anybody here today that needs to receive you as personal Lord and Savior, that you would humble them, Lord, help them to just bow down before you in, in truth and honesty and sincerity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.